thank you very much, Alan, for the kind introduction, and uh, uh, Brad and uh, the GI for inviting me to speak at this uh, talk. Uh, I will be sharing with you today some of my thoughts and impressions about the uh, 2020 Port of Beirut explosion, its impact on the community, and uh, you will see me calling it a rare extreme event, and uh, you'll see why. Beirut, August 4, 2020, 6 p.m. A fire starts in Port of Beirut. You are seeing the silos, the grain silos there. This is a major land. This explosion is amongst the most powerful non-nuclear explosions in history. Uh, this is a list uh, that I picked off Wikipedia. The first one would be the Halifa port of Halifax explosion. It happens to be another port explosion, which I will allude to a little bit later in this presentation. What were the impacts? Casualties were around 207 deaths, 7,500 injuries, almost 300,000 people homeless, uh, major structural and infrastructure damage. This is a, the port of Beirut is in the heart of the Beirut metro area. Massive damage. Two hospitals, at least two hospitals were severely damaged, which also impeded their ability to treat the victims as well. Massive damage, and this is showing you a little bit the location of the blast relative to the grain silos. Um, GEAR, the uh, association, uh, de deploys teams after disasters to try to learn, survey the damage, and develop lessons that we learn from these disasters. Um, this was not a single disaster. There was a superposition of disasters. Lebanon was already encountering and continues to encounter severe and political, uh, political and economic crises at the time. On top of that, there was the COVID-19 pandemic which had severe impacts in Lebanon, severe impacts on travel and mobility. So we couldn't just go simply travel to Lebanon and do the survey, so we had to be creative and improvise. So we, we had a um, multi-hybrid virtual uh, in-person team from the US, Italy, and Lebanon. And we had to also improvise with equipment. We used consumer-grade electronics to survey the damage in a creative way instead of shipping some fairly uh, high-end equipment from the US. And it's really a template, potentially, even though this was you know, happening through a crisis, it was really, it's a model for us for the future deployments uh, around the world. Uh, it's a broad-based effort. I, my role was just a small part, really. Uh, people who are listed here did the uh, heavy lifting. Uh, AUB and the faculty and uh, students there did a lot of work, as well as many other organizations. The findings from our report are published online and on the GEAR Association website, and the data that we've collected is all available. There's a link on the website, and you can um, access it is uh, stored on Design Safe in the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So the, a little bit about the history of the Port of Beirut. It goes back to mil millennia, 15th century BC, it's first mention of it, and it's been almost in continuous operation to the present day. Major uh, development and expansion of the port happened over the last uh, century or two. And uh, here you're seeing a uh, fill from the early 1900s. And then you are looking at the um, 
as construction of the silos in the 1960s. They were built, these are grain silos in the 1960s built in two stages. They are founded on pile foundation in that fill area of the port. This is a, a survey of the damage to the grain silo and the crater. You're seeing the crater on the right of the uh, image. And uh, there were three rows of uh, silos. The first one was pulverized. What you're looking at here, the material there is grain, actually. It's not that. These grain silos pass through the, you have 85% of the country's grain. So we're talking about losing that, that you're actually losing potential food source for an entire country. So now we're not talking about just the immediate damage, but we're talking about a potential cascading or amplification of that. And this was done by colleagues in Europe, a mix of drone and laser scan images. They're, they're just spectacular. The silos originally tilted away from the uh, explosion, and they acted almost as a shield in that area, and now they are tilting back towards the crater. Um, uh, Survey damage was done by uh, creating, uh, innovating, whereby a consumer grade 360 camera was rigged over a car and it was driven through historic neighborhoods. These neighborhoods have homes that are 100, 200 plus years old. Uh, we wanted to, uh, to survey the damage there and we had damage classification. The reason we wanted to do that, there was a, a scientific part of it, which is to compare with satellite uh, capabilities that we had uh, access to and collaborated with at the JPL, J Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, where you can use these satellite uh, images before and after. You can see a reflection, uh, changes in, in reflections, and uh, you can then develop these damage proxy maps. And from a scientific point of view, we were able to do this ground truthing of that. Having the capability to remotely quickly identify where are the critical areas of damage is very important for uh, relief and recovery uh, after an event and also seeing the reconstruction, how it's progressing as well. So there's a great value in that. So now I want to take us a little bit, step back and uh, raise some questions and look at the broader context of this, what I'm calling a rare extreme event. Why did it happen? Could it have been prevented? What do we learn or relearn from this disaster? So there has been recognition throughout history of the importance of safety, construction codes, and enforcement, and incentivizing the builders to build well. If we go back to the Code of Hammurabi in 1700 BC or earlier, uh, really, they had a very strong incentive for builders to do build, build well because they said if, uh, you know, there are these are different provisions of the Code of Hammurabi, and one of them is that if your structure falls, kills somebody, the builder, there's a death penalty associated with it. It's pretty severe, okay, the Code of Hammurabi, but it's the thinking about, you know, how do we incentivize people to do the right thing. In uh, 1871, a major fire uh, went through Chicago and really it prompted changes in building code and fire codes. Uh, of course, uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow was unfortunately blamed for that fire, but really there were other reasons for this major fire. The Halifax 1917 explosion, it was a munition ship, part of the World War I effort that went into the port of Halifax and uh, collided with another ship there were a series of mistakes. A fire started and the munition ship blew up. 2,000 deaths and many injured. Many people actually became blind. In fact, it was the uh, foundation of the Association for Blind in Canada. And the legacy is improved maritime safety and building codes. So we had these disasters before. We learn from them, we put in codes. Uh, and then now we have additional items, sustainability, resiliency, within the context of extreme events, performance-based design. So we've really recognized now the importance of all these factors as we are developing our infrastructure. We recognize the interdependency. We have oil, electric, water, telecom, gas, transportation, financial markets, markets health system, food system. These are things that, for example, came up in the Beirut explosion. Yet, these things happen. Uh, it is not enough to have codes 
whether it's building or safety, it's actually the framework for implementation and enforcement. Uh, the story is not fully out on what happened there, but there are uh, reports that there might have been uh, notification to higher ups that there is an issue of this ammonium nitride sitting in these hangars. The story is unclear. Uh, you know, that this is, you know, storing it in the midst of an urban area is probably not a good idea. We talked about uh, Chicago fire. Well, I ran into a series of articles uh, in the Chicago Tribune recently about continuous fi you know, fires in buildings and people unfortunately being injured and dying because of lax enforcement. Um, and just last week, we have now to deal with another dimension related to the resiliency of our infrastructure, which is a cyber attack that stopped the colonial pipeline, causing fuel shortages, and the story is still not out on that. And so now, even as engineers, we need to start thinking about the cyber dimension and how it man manifests itself into the physical dimension. So, in conclusion, uh, Port of Beirut explosion is really a tragic reminder of the importance of building and safety codes with meaningful implementation and enforcement framework. So it's not enough to just have the code, you have to implement it. And we have to recognize that we will continue to have to deal with the superposition of disasters. In Lebanon, it was the COVID-19 pandemic, economic collapse, loss of grain reserves. This really amplified the impacts are still being felt till today. Um, fortunately, part of the port was still operational, but we really now need to understand once again recognize the interdependencies and that we are dealing with system of systems. Thank you.